Hello, my name is Megan Nakamura. And my name is Angela Pallant. And today we'll be focusing on the biomechanics of freestyle swimming, mainly focusing on arm kinematics. So to start off, a little bit of history on swimming. Competitive swimming started in Britain at around 1830, originally just competing with the breaststroke. The first Olympics with competitive swimming was held in Athens, Greece in 1896, and in this event, all the, stroke, all the strokes were freestyle, also known as crawl stroke. You can see an example of this in the image in the upper right hand corner. The World Swimming Association was then formed in 1908. Freestyle swimming is typically uh, referred to as swimming in the open water, but over time, People has referred to it synonymously with a specific type of stroke known as the crawl. Crawl stroke is the only stroke out of the four general ones not regulated by the World Swimming Association. In competitive swimming, four strokes are involved. These strokes are known as butterfly, backstroke, breaststroke, and freestyle. Out of the four, freestyle is often the most widely known of stroke. So, what makes up a crawl stroke? There are several components. Let's begin with the reach forward. Typically, as one arm is reaching forward, the other is reaching backward. The reach forward is full forward extension of the arm and shoulder with an open palm of the hand placed just under the surface of the water. In this movement, there is a slight torso rotation to assist in the shoulder extension. The more stretched, the better. Next is the downward stroke. The arm moves downward below the torso with the elbow flexed to approximately 90 degrees, imitating a crawl. Hence, we get the name crawl stroke. Again, we maintain an open palm here. The arm then fully extends along the torso, this time towards the feet. More elbow extension and torso rotation also help here. The arm then exits the water and re-enters the water in front of the head at an angle, avoiding a slap of the palm or the arm. The elbow is flexed at about 90 degrees here and, and extends as the hand re-enters the water. Throughout the entire stroke, the feet are constantly performing a flutter kick with the feet ideally mostly submerged. Additionally, head movement is always minimized. So for our presentation, as mentioned before, we will be focusing on freestyle swimming and the arm kinematics involved, and will primarily be focusing on the influence of the swimmer's range of motion, angular kinematics, and stroke length factors. To begin, a swimmer's range of motion is crucial to the swimmer's ability to perform the most efficient stroke. For some background, humans have on average about 180 degrees of arm flexion, between 45 and 60 degrees of extension, about 150 degrees of abduction, and about 30 to 50 degrees of adduction. Human arms are also able to perform about 70 to 90 degrees of medial rotation with a bent elbow and around 90 degrees of lateral rotation. The main reason for the huge range of motion is because the human's upper limbs act as a third class lever, which allows for a greater range of motion. With the water acting as the resistance, the bicep and other upper arm internal rota rotators acting as the force, while the axis at which the lever can rotate are the glenohumeral um, and elbow joints. The glenohumeral joint operates as the primary axis of rotation as the arm enters the water parallel to the surface to decrease drag during the forward reach portion of the stroke, as seen in the far right of the image, and then still is the primary axis of rotation as the stroke moves in the downward phase as seen in the left part of the image. The shoulder then abducts as the elbow flexes as seen in the middle illustration of the, as the swimmer transitions from the downstroke phase to the glide phase. The reason why a swimmer wants to have a greater range of motion is it allows for a greater stroke rate as it allows for the faster cycling of the stroke. A greater velocity of the stroke is then generated due to a smaller moment arm caused by a third class lever system of the human arm as mentioned previously. This, also, this is also because a smaller moment arm creates a greater force by the muscles. Another biomechanical concept we want to focus on is angular kin kinetics particularly torque and tangential velocity. So as the arm moves during the downstroke phase, the shoulder rotates at the glenohumeral joint with the arm about 90 degrees to the upper arm, flexed at the elbow joint. As the elbow flexes to its 90 degrees downstroke phase and then extends back to around 170 degrees during the follow through phase, torque is generated as the arm is rotated about an axis generating, generated by the flexion of the elbow and internal rotation of the arm. This causes a propulsion force, which according, 
which accounts for 85 to 90 percent of the total propulsion force genera generated according to Hollander et al. in 1988. The swimmer utilizes the tangential velocity generated by the torques to propel themselves forward where they can in transition into the glide phase of the stroke. The swimmer is able to use this tangential velocity during the glide stage because they tuck their arms at full extension closer to their body, which allows them to decrease water resistance as the swimmer's bodies become more streamlined. So with increased force generation and streamlining of the body preferred, it is also vital that we discuss the role of the swimmer's hands. While they may seem like an accessory at times, the hands play a vital role for increasing drag and decreasing lift. This means that when the arm is in the water, the hand plays a part in the thrust created during the downstroke phase, which is seen by the large separate peaks in net streamwise thrust found in a study by Cohen et al. This is because, as Team USA's te swim team puts it, when in the water, the hands act like, an oar, like the oars used during rowing. The hands increase the surface area for the resistance of the water to act on, and therefore cause a greater torque and greater force generated to propel the body forward. In fact, the reason why Michael Phelps is so successful is due to his webbed fingers and abnormally large hands, as seen in the image, which allows him to, quote, grip, unquote, the water better and create a greater drag to propel himself with more force generated by his arm muscles. In a similar concept, this is why swimmers lift their arms out of the water during the forward reach phase of the stroke. This is because the swimmers need to get their arms back in the water in front of them so they can lift their hands just barely above the surface of the water. This is done because the air above has less resistance than the water, so it will have a less of a negative force going against the momentum of the body. As you just saw, hands play a great role in mastering the crawl stroke. Of course, there are several other factors that play into having a good crawl stroke. Stroke velocity can be expressed in an equation as equal to stroke length, or distance traveled by each stroke, times stroke rate, or the frequency of strokes. These two components can be met to create the ideal stroke pattern. As previously mentioned, stroke rate can be improved by a greater range of motion, since this decreases the moment arm of the joint in relation to the rest of the arm, allowing the swimmer to produce a greater horizontal force. Also, the kick of the stroke can affect the arm stroke rate, since a weaker kick can decrease the forward momentum of the body and thus increase the downward force of the body in the water, which will take away from the impact of the horizontal force. Meanwhile, Stroke length is really made up of two components, the reach and the glide. Mastering these two components is key to improving stroke length. Swimmers can increase their stroke length by reducing the resistance of their hand during forward and back reach by angling their hand properly and balancing their torso rotation so it is even on both sides. Working on resistance of the hand helps with the reaching portion and working against the resistance of the water while balancing torso rotation and keeping the head as still as possible serves to improve the glide of the body. These details help to propel the swimmer's body horizontally, since they emphasize the horizontal force and diminish vertical force. All these details can help increase stroke length, which can in turn increase the velocity of the stroke if the rate is maintained. However, the swimmer can be at risk of losing stroke length if they increase stroke rate too much, since they can lose glide time. Thus, it is essential to balance these two details to improve the overall stroke. Finally, if you have longer arms, you may be in luck. People with longer arms can extend their arm and shoulder further in the reach phase of the crawl stroke, meaning they get more gliding. An example of someone who has this is Michael Phelps. So, he doesn't have to increase frequency as much to have a significant effect on his stroke velocity. In summary, many kinematic movements are involved in the crawl stroke and swimmers need to keep these things in mind when working to improve their stroke and swim time and performance. They need to keep a balance between all these factors, such as we just saw with stroke length versus stroke frequency. And finally, Michael Phelps is a genetic mystery, and he will be better at swimming than any of us ever will be. Thank you!